Can you uh, give us a rundown of your, um, your, your rise through Scientology, uh, what different posts you held and uh, from there? All right, well, in uh, January of 1978, I began in the C organization, which is the, you know, the million year, billion year contract, you know, lifetime commitment and more. And I went to Los Angeles. Um, I, did, uh, per I was on a project to do purchasing for the renovations of the uh, Cedars of Lebanon Hospital Complex, which is a whole full block of Scientology service uh, organizations. Uh, I did that for about, I guess, nine months or something like that. And then shortly after that, I went on to uh, the Winter Headquarters, which was uh, the name of the base out of La Quinta, out in the desert, where Hubbard was, where there was a group of maybe 100, 100 150 people that were um, putting together a what they called a um, cinematography organization to film dissemination films and instructional films. And this is, I'm sorry, this is L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology? Correct. Right, okay. Okay. And uh, so you, uh, did you meet Mr. Hubbard? No, I never did meet him. Okay. Did he was you? just leaving there when I got there. In fact, one of my first, he was, he, he was originally going to leave temporarily. Um, and one of my first jobs was to help renovate um, his home there because it was anticipated that he would return, but he never did return. Okay. And what did you do after that? And then I, after that, I became, uh, I went into what was called L. Ron Hubbard External Communications, and we handled all the uh, communication relays between L. Ron Hubbard and the rest of the church. Okay. And um, uh, what time period are we talking about now? What this is like 1979. Okay. Yeah, 79 and 80. Okay. I did that for about two years. All right. And then after that? And then after that, and in 1981, I went on to this, what was called the Special Project, which was a small group headed by David Miscavige. He was actually called the operator, so he, you know, everybody from the unit answered to him. And there was four other people in it. And our job was to find out uh, and really investigate and get to the bottom of uh, why there were so many lawsuits naming L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of Scientology. And... Um, come up with a solution as to how to get rid of those lawsuits because he was getting on in years and um, the, the idea was he wanted to come back to um, what is now called the International Headquarters or the Int Base in just outside of San Jacinto, California, um, where films, dissemination, and um, educational are made. And he wanted to get those, those films done and get them done. So our job was to try to get rid of all these lawsuits that were outstanding against him so that he could come back there uh, harassment free and live out his days working on what he wanted to work on. Okay. Okay. And how long were you in this position? Well, I guess I was on it for the rest of my career in, in a way. I mean, there was different permutations of it. It was first called the Special Project, then it was called the Special Unit, and then it was called, then we, we established the Office of Special Affairs to, to um, replaced the Guardian's office, and then I was at Author Services, which was L. Ron Hubbard's uh, personal literary agency, he handled all his personal business, and I was a legal executive there. But again, I was, I was still working on clearing away anything that might embroil L. Ron Hubbard in legal matters or external facing matters. All the way up, that's all the way up through 86 now. So this is a you know, five, year, five year period through there. Okay. And when you first started this post, this is when you first encountered David Miscavige? 1981, June of 1980. Well, I actually knew him earlier casually, but not first time I ever worked with him. I see. Okay. All right. Uh, and so thereafter, you tell us about, there's some highlights of your career uh, that we've talked about uh, uh, where you did some major things for Scientology. Can you talk about that, uh, uh, I guess, the early 1990s, uh, when there were problems with the IRS? Well, yes, the IRS was um, really an extension of this all-clear concept of getting rid of all the legal matters or external-facing matters that are hindering Scientology. It was tied in with, the, with uh, uh, about a couple of dozen lawsuits were brought around the country naming L. Ron Hubbard. Um, some grand, grand juries that were outstanding from the old Guardian's Office activity that were 
There was one in Tampa, one in D.C., and I believe one in New York that were still trying to get indictments against uh, Mr. Hubbard. You know, even after the Guardian's office, people had been indicted and convicted in Washington. So all these things sort of tied together with one another. And um, it was always perceived that the IRS was the most important thing to handle because if you have tax exemption, you have uh, a religious, religious recognition, you're treated differently in courts. You know, there's a, there's a you know, some, some level of almost immunity, First Amendment immunity, to a lot of the type of allegations that were being made. So the IRS was the big thing to handle. I mean, when, when I was involved in that in the late 80s, we had calculated that they, the IRS, considered that the churches had upward of a billion dollars in liability, and the total reserves of the church were a, were a fraction of that maybe in the 200 million range. So literally they could have wiped Scientology out five times through. So um, between having got rid of a lot of the civil suits in the mid 80s and 93 when we ultimately got exemption, I mean the number one mission was to obtain uh, tax exemption from the IRS and mm -hmm. you know that was the bulk of what my attention was on and what I worked on. And you were right at the center of that IRS effort, right? Uh, you uh, worked with Mr. Miscavige. Can you tell us about that w with the IRS people? Yeah, okay. Well, um, in the late, not late 80s uh, and going into the early 90s, uh, you know, I was tasked with, the, with, with um, implementing um, strategies to try to overwhelm the IRS like they were attempting to overwhelm us. I mean, it was sort of like a fight fire with fire situation. Um, we brought FY Freedom Information Act lawsuits um, in numerous different jurisdictions. We had legal uh, litigation strategies to um, counteract their strategies to deny certain churches exemption and that sort of thing. But it, it, was, a, it was a huge battlefield that was nationwide. There was literally 2,700 suits at one point. And I was very much involved in coordinating and coming up with strategies and then executing a lot of that between the late 80s and the early 90s. And then in uh, late 91, uh, Dave Miscavige and myself were in Washington, and Miscavige kept bringing up with the attorneys, you know, why don't we just sit down with the commissioner and get this thing straightened out because there's so much, you know, there's so, there's so much insanity that goes on when you have this kind of institutional fight going on for so long. You know, you're fighting over issues that are anachronistic in a lot of cases. They're just, they're not, they're not even, you know, we're, we're fighting over, for example, we're fighting over the years 70 through 72. That's as far as the litigation had reached. And here we are 20 years later in 1991. So he kept pressing that, you know, why don't we just go straight to the top and talk to the commissioner. And we had a lot of expensive attorneys from D.C. and Washington who were, you know, attempting at different levels to start negotiations, and that went in fits and starts. And one day we were in Washington, and finally, uh, Dave said to one of the attorneys there, he said, "You know, we're going to just go straight down there and go see Fred." And he, of course, the attorney was laughing, and he turned to me and he said, "Right?" And I said, "Yeah." And then, you know, was they all thought it was a joke. And we, uh, right afterwards, we just got up from lunch, got in a cab, and went straight down there and opened the door, you know, opened the door to, to, to get negotiations going. We didn't get in a meeting, as has been reported. We didn't just walk in to the commissioner's office. We walked in and said we'd like to bury the hatchet. A couple of assistants, assistants of the commissioner came down and saw us, took all our information, said, he would get, said they'd get back to us, and they did, uh, I think it was even later that day, set up a meeting with the commissioner for the following week. This is Fred Goldberg? Yeah, right. Fred Goldberg. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that began a, a process uh, after that? That began a process. I mean, all Fred Goldberg did was open up the door to creating a, a forum where we could make a case for exemption. Um, and what he did that, that, was, that was, uh, was so positive and unique was is he tried to bring somebody in who was fresh, who, who knew exempt organizations but didn't have a long history with Scientology. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there were some real haters, some real Scientology haters within that, you know, had an attitude of you, no matter what you said, they were going to, you know, they were going to deny the exemption. And um, 
So all he did was put, give us the ability to, to, to meet with a team that didn't really have a, a long track record on this, yet knew exempt organizations, knew what the requirements were, and said, okay, prove you're exempt. And then that process went on for at least two years. I mean, we were literally commuting to Washington, D.C. almost every week. It was Monday or Sunday out to D.C., see the IRS, present answers to their, their set of questions, get another set of questions, go back to L.A., get the information together, get the, you know, some would entail audits of certain units or this sort of thing. You know, you'd have to account for different things mm -hmm. in, in operations, in finances and that sort of thing. Boom, next Sunday, back on a plane, back to D.C., another meeting. With you. That went for two years. And this process is, is it? Is you and Mr. Miscavige primarily? Primarily. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, uh, attorneys came in, started coming with us. We mm -hmm. really started getting more technical audit issues. Um, Mike Rinder uh, attended several of the meetings. Heber Gensch attended several of the meetings. And then we would sometimes bring in experts on different fields, like Rick Moxon came into one on FOIA. Um, Bill Walsh was another FOIA attorney who came in and attended one or two meetings. But primarily, uh, the two constants through the, from the beginning to the end were uh, Dave and myself. 